Just one other piece of evidence that uh, marijuana is not a risk factor for the development of COPD. I think I'm convinced of that. And the other major health consequence, pulmonary health consequence of tobacco is lung cancer. Cancer is the second most common cause of death uh, in, in the U.S. And lung cancer is the most common form of cancer. And the major risk factor for lung cancer is tobacco smoking. About 160,000 Americans die each year of lung cancer. So the question that came to my mind and that of my colleagues was whether or not there was any evidence that marijuana would at least qualitatively share some of these health risks with those of tobacco. And that uh, was the rationale for initiating our studies back in the 1980s. What is the evidence that marijuana smoking, habitual marijuana smoking, can lead to lung cancer? With respect to the development of lung cancer, uh, we uh, found no evidence of any increased risk of lung cancer uh, occurrence in association with marijuana smoking alone. The marijuana smokers, if anything, had a reduced risk for developing lung cancer. Not a significantly reduced risk, but reduced less than a one-fold. So that means reduced. Whereas the tobacco smokers had a markedly increased risk. If uh, the, those who smoke more than two packs a day had a 20-fold increase in the risk. That's 2,000%. Those who smoke from one to two uh, packs a day uh, had an eight-fold risk. It's 800%. And so, um, so that contrasts with no risk, no increased risk, or any slightly reduced risk with the marijuana smokers. THC actually has an anti-tumor effect. And uh, these are studies that were done both in experimental animals and in cell culture systems and for different kinds of cancer. For lung cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, gliomas, brain cancer, that the development and growth, or well, the growth actually of the tumor is, is suppressed by THC and metastases are also suppressed. So how can that be? Well, THC impairs protein synthesis and it's what we call anti-mitogenic or anti-proliferative. You need so tumor cells don't as readily proliferate in the presence of THC. They're also uh, anti-angiogenic so they interfere with the growth and development of new blood vessels that are necessary for metastatic spread. And they also are pro-apoptotic. What is apoptosis? Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So when cells age, there is a mechanism whereby the cells die. Uh, it's a non-necrotic death to die off the old cells and the, we get rid of them before they have an opportunity to develop mutations that would lead to cancer. So enhancing apoptosis diminishes the risk of the cells becoming cancerous. So marijuana turns out, THC rather, turns out to be pro-apoptotic. So those appear to be the mechanisms that might account for these anti-tumoral effects of THC. We decided to do our own case control study. Funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a major funding agency for marijuana-related research. This was the largest study uh, ever conducted on this subject. It was very well designed. We used the U uh, Los Angeles uh, Tumor Registry to identify, rapidly ascertain, all the cases of lung cancer and head and neck cancer <clears throat> that occur, that were diagnosed in the LA County system. And uh, of course, by the time we got to some of them, they'd already died or they were too sick, but we got to it, over 60% of them who agreed to participate and uh, were able to participate. And we administered this questionnaire and then we matched them to controls, the uh, same age, socioeconomic status, that lived in the same neighborhood using an algorithm that USC developed for this purpose to, so that we could match, you know, we're comparing apples with apples. And then we administered the, this detailed questionnaire at the food frequency questions, occupational history, all kinds of things. We also did molecular 
uh, we got uh, a buccal smear so we could look at the DNA, could we look at the genetics of lung cancer. Uh, so what we did was to recruit uh, uh, smokers, heavy smokers of marijuana, um, at least a joint a day for a week. And it ended up that the average smoker of marijuana whom we recruited smoked three joints a day for about 15 years. And um, uh, that's we also required that they smoke that much for five years. But on the average, they smoked three joints for 15 years. So that's about 45 to 50 joint years. A joint year is, is the number of joints smoked uh, times the number of years smoked. Over the study population was, I think, be between 35 and 59. I think 35 was a younger age group. Because we thought that they had to be uh, teenagers in their early 20s at the time of the, at least in the marijuana epidemic, which you know was in the, in the mid 60s. So prior to that time, very few people used marijuana, but after that time, it just mushroomed up to 1979, which represented actually the apex, the acme of use of marijuana in our society. So that, we, that's why we chose those age limits. And so what did we find? Uh, for any category of cannabis use, including heavy use, heavy use we define as more than 10 joint years, but we looked at 20 joint years and 30 joint years. For every category of marijuana use, the ratio was less than one, meaning reduced risk. It wasn't significantly reduced, but it was reduced. With, uh, and the confidence intervals were not that, that wide uh, around the point estimate. So there was no evidence, and we controlled for all the known or putative factors, uh, close for socioeconomic status, concomitant, tobacco smoking, alcohol, etc. At the same time when we did a similar analysis for the tobacco smokers, there was a huge effect of tobacco. Gee, we ought to do something, Fred. Okay. How's about taking a nap? Hey, I got a better idea. Let's take a Winston break. That's it. Winston is the one filter cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston's got that filter blend. Yeah, Fred. Filter blend makes the big taste difference, and only Winston has it up front where it counts. Here, ahead of the pure white filters. Winston packs rich tobaccos specially selected and specially processed for good flavor in filter smoking. Yeah, Bonnie, Winston tastes good like a cigarette chug. So I'm a cancer doctor and every day I see patients with cancer who have nausea from their chemotherapy or their cancer, loss of appetite, pain, depression, insomnia, and my experience over the past 30 years of being an oncologist is that there's one medicine that I could recommend to patients that can take care of all of those problems. Instead of writing five different prescription drugs, all of which have side effects and addictive potential, uh, I can tell my cancer patients to try marijuana uh, to take care of any combination of those symptoms. The first study that I really wanted to do was in patients uh, with this so-called AIDS wasting syndrome, which was something we saw before the availability of uh, active antiretroviral drugs. And patients with HIV infection just wasted away. They lost weight, they got diarrhea and fevers. And uh, dronabinol, Delta 9 THC, became available to help those patients increase their appetite. When we prescribed those patients uh, dronabinol in the early 90s, they said, you know, this is okay, but I really prefer to smoke real cannabis because uh, when you take uh, cannabis by mouth, either as Delta 9 THC or eating, in fact, baked products, the absorption is very slow and variable. So it takes about two and a half hours for a peak to be reached and the peak level in the blood is quite low and then it stays in the body for quite a long time as well. Also when taken by mouth, uh, the Delta 9 THC becomes converted by the liver to another psychoactive metabolite. So people that take dronabinol or eat cannabis bake products often get more zonk than people who smoke because when you smoke you don't get that second metabolite. Also when you smoke you get a very rapid peak in the blood of, in two and a half minutes as opposed to two and a half hours. So people can really control the onset of the activity 
and how long it lasts better if they're smoking rather than swallowing either a pill or eating a baked product. So our first study that we hoped to do in the early 90s was to show that smoked cannabis uh, was better than dronabinol in increasing appetite in patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. I tried twice uh, to get cannabis from the government because they're the only legal source of, of marijuana for clinical trials and both times I failed. I then went to Alan Leshner, who at the time was the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and he explained to me, in fact, that the government, uh, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has a congressional mandate only to study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So my request to have marijuana to study it as a potential therapeutic agent could never be granted by the government because, again, Congress says you can only study these substances as substances of abuse and not as treatments for disease. So in 1996, the terrain changed when we got uh, HIV drugs that actually worked and we didn't see the wasting syndrome anymore. But these drugs were broken down by the liver by the same pathway that metabolizes some illicit substances. And there was a report in the literature of a patient dying from an ecstasy overdose who is one one of the AIDS antiviral drugs who took ecstasy at the same time. So I said, uh-huh, a little light bulb went off. I said, maybe I should study to see if it's safe for patients on the AIDS antiretroviral drugs to smoke cannabis. And so I submitted that grant to the government and that worked within their schema because I was looking to see if it was harmful. And with that application, I finally succeeded and got a million dollars in 1,400 government cigarettes to study in patients with HIV. Now, these patients didn't have the wasting syndrome anymore, but the end point of our study was, is there a change in the amount of AIDS virus in the bloodstream after 21 days of exposure to either three government cigarettes a day or three dronabinol capsules or three placebo capsules. And so we looked at the change in the HIV virus and it didn't change at all. We also looked at the interaction between the cannabinoids, uh, either smoked or oral, and the amount of AIDS drug in the bloodstream and that didn't change clinically significantly either. We also knew that people were concerned that marijuana might have an impact on the immune system that could be negative and we looked at that very carefully in these HIV patients and we found no evidence of any negative effect and, and perhaps some evidence of benefit in the immune system in patients uh, smoking even more than taking uh, the, the capsules. In my opinion, the whole plant is the medicine that, that nature provided and it's, it's the best medicine. It's truly amazing uh, the number of conditions that respond favorably to cannabis. The number one condition is pain. Uh, cannabis uh, is useful in relieving people's pain. It's particularly effective in relieving pain from connected tissue disorders, from arthritis, from fibromyalgia, from systemic lupus, from reflex sympathetic dystrophy, a whole host of conditions that we don't really understand very well. People seem to get a good relief from cannabis. Uh, people are able to decrease the amount of opiates that they're taking and in some instances to stop taking opiates entirely uh, for pain control. The first modern research that was done on cannabis was done in 1949 that demonstrated its usefulness in treating epilepsy. I have a number of people who don't have epilepsy when they use cannabis regularly. The founder of modern medicine is a physician named Sir William Osler who was prominent around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. He wrote the first textbook of internal medicine and in that textbook he said that cannabis was the most effective medication for the treatment of migraine headaches. And I certainly have a number of people with migraines who get substantial relief or even prevention of their migraines by consumption of cannabis. Other conditions that commonly respond favorably to marijuana include depression. Uh, it helps people with sleep. It helps their appetite. Uh, it's also very good in treating uh, GI symptoms, uh, nausea, uh, diarrhea. 
Uh, it's excellent for treating Crohn's disease. We did a little study of people with Crohn's disease and found that many of them were able to stop using steroids and stop using other medications that they had taken for their Crohn's, that they had uh, less diarrhea, they had less abdominal pain. It was a true miracle for them. Uh, there's a, a list here of conditions that was originally developed by Dr. Todd McCurry, 